really excited to have with us here right now both Trevor and Marlon, who've um, started along with a third person named Troy Carter, a venture capital fund recently, Cross Culture Ventures. Really excited for you both to be here since I've actually known them both for a number of years through the Kauffman Fellows Program and I'm a small uh, LP investor in their fund. So I'll go ahead and quickly introduce both uh, Trevor, Marlin, really accomplished backgrounds, but I'll keep it pretty short and quick. Um, so Trevor um, started out as a consultant at Accenture, um, worked on a number of companies like Microsoft, Best Buy, uh, Center Bridge Partners. Um, he also is an entrepreneur and was CEO of a company called Third Space, which is a really cool startup aimed at creating uh, local cultural experiences at airport lounges, and also has been a former investor and vice president at a food-related uh, venture capital firm called Gastronomy Ventures. Um, so that's Trevor over here, and then Marlon over here um, is um, also a really interesting person with a long resume. So he started out his career in venture capital as an investment director at Intel, um, Intel Capital, and um, he led a number of investments for their diversity fund for both women and minorities. Um, and now um, he's actually come to start uh, Cross Culture Ventures. Um, some of the investments that Cross Culture has had has included um, AfroStream, Incoming Media, Lend Street, um, Mark One, Maven, uh, MongoDB, Thrive Market, and a number of other interesting investments. Um, and then, of course, um, for this class session, we're also really interested in hearing about celebrity investing and that being a new trend that's happened with, you see celebrities like uh, Justin Bieber investing, um, uh, Serena Williams, uh, Magic Johnson. So um, they've had the fortune of co-investing with a number of these. And I think I actually invested in your fund before Magic Johnson invested, is that correct? That is true. My claim to fame, so. <laughs> um, so, um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and um, kick off with a couple of questions and then open it up to the class to ask additional questions. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you both decided to start Cross Culture VC? Sure, sure. So first off, thanks for having us here. Um, you know, we're huge fans of you and everyone in this class, you guys should, 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 should know that she's the, the real deal. So listen to her. Not at all, no. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, we had each been doing venture for a while and kind of independently we come across this thesis that what drives or one thing that drives a lot of value in early stage companies is something very different from technology. So we thought that to be culture or a company's ability to really um, benefit from mainstream cultural trends. Um, so we decided to come to, 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 to together and build a fund around, around that idea. You know, it kind of was a process of, you know, meeting each other, hanging out, and really forming that idea in a way that we all were really excited about it. Yeah, not, not sure what else uh, to add to that. Um, I guess just to, to, to hammer, hammer in what we mean by, by culture and, um, and why culture um, eats the world. Uh, it, it's the one intangible thing that creates norms, right? Um, and from norms comes, comes habits. So if we can understand uh, culture, we can basically predict um, what consumer behavior will look like in the future. And if we in, um, invest along the lines of what we believe consumers will do in the future, we're going to invest in tomorrow's next big companies, big enterprises. So that's what we're really after. And we look at it, um, culture from over 180 countries. Um, so. mm -hmm. Can you provide an example of one of your recent investments that really touches upon that investment thesis? Go for it. Uh, yeah, so, so one, one company that we did, I'm trying to be careful of what we can say and what we can't say, but one company that we did is called Thrive Market. Um, and Thrive Market's based out of Los Angeles and it's a uh, company that's essentially like Whole Foods meets Costco online. Um, the idea is that you can pay, you know, a, a yearly sub subscription fee and get the exact same food you can get at Whole Foods for, you know, 30 to 40 per percent less. <coughs> now, how that, how this company fit our, fit our thesis was, um, you know, health and wellness is a huge mainstream cultural trend um, that to, up to this point has been primarily marketed towards just a small percentage of the population. You know, think of, you know, affluent moms in San Diego and San Francisco and other major um, cities. Uh, we had data points that suggested that 
the huge base of the pyramid um, of the population would love to eat healthy foods and embrace a healthy lifestyle if uh, products were marketed within their price range. And Thrive did exactly that. Of course, they had a great team. They had, you know, great technology. They had, um, you know, they were targeting a huge market, et cetera, all those basic venture tenants. Um, but we think that the most powerful thing about their company is their ability to democratize um, this mainstream trend of health. Um, so the topic of celebrity investing, um, you've invested in a number of companies with celebrities as co-investors. Can you talk about how that process typically works? Um, how does that usually come about? Do you usually approach these um, individuals or do they come to you or how does the entire deal usually come together? Yeah. Do you want to yeah. So we, we actually get that, um, get that question a lot, right? A lot of folks, be, because our third partner is, is fairly famous, um, you know, the, the assumption is that that's, that's pretty much what we do, right? We invest and we bring influencers. But um, a fund that invests um, in, uh, solely on an influencer strategy is not really a fund. It's not gonna be sustainable. Um, so we're, we're pretty careful in terms of when, when we decide to, to, um, to introduce an opportunity to celebrities or to anyone in our network for that matter. There needs to be um, a, a strong mutual benefit, otherwise we don't make the, um, make the introduction. Um, so uh, one example, um, Serena Williams is an investor in, in Maven, one of our um, companies that focuses on, on, on women and empowering hairstylists so that they, um, they can participate in the, in, in the revenues that are um, generated uh, around products um, in the beauty salon. And um, Serena Williams is all about empowering um, women. So the two brands just, just fit. Um, so so that, that made sense, right? And, and that's basically the way, the way we, go, we go about making those introductions and um, the way companies, I, I think, should think about bringing on um, celebrity investors. How will, they, um, how will they help your, your brand outside of the initial, you know, maybe hoopla or whatever that such and such is involved? How can they actually add value beyond that? And then, um, go ahead. Yeah, just say that, you know, the, just to, to add, the idea that a so celebrity being <coughs> on board in a startup provides rocket fuel is kind of like popular culture mythology. <coughs> and that it, <coughs> It's happened in like a few cases that we can count on our hands, uh, but the rest of them have been n not as influential to people like you that are the early adopters of technologies. So, so you know, finding, threading that needle of uh, finding people that are well, well known, that are really, really powerful, um, and pushing a brand forward is, is, is a very difficult balancing act. And, and it still happens, mm -hmm. um, but, it's, but it's hard. And then just to provide some context, since we don't have Troy Carter here today, uh, Troy Carter was uh, Lady Gaga's former music manager and has done a number of angel investments in uh, companies like Uber, Lyft, Warby Parker, a number of really top uh, consumer brands as an angel investor. And he's actually also on this season's Shark Tank. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, um, and obviously Troy Carter started Adam Factory. What's mm -hmm. the partnership between, and you're wearing the Adam Factory sweater. <laughs> yeah. um, what's the partnership between that and Cross Culture? Yeah, so um, we, we kind of see it as, as one thing. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a true par partnership. So as you said, Adam Factory is a top tier artist management agency. Um, you know, they still manage folks like Megan Trainer, Charlie Puth, John Legend, um, and a few others. Uh, you know, it's really a platform that empowers artists and entrepreneurs. Um, and it's a symbiotic system where, where entrepreneurs are able to use the same techniques that artists use to propagate their brands. And then artists, in turn, are able to capitalize on new t technologies to propagate their brand and their music or whatever that they're, they happen to, to be doing. So we really see it as a as a as kind of a singular unit that operates within culture. Yeah. So to double double click on that, what um, so you talked about Troy's background and Lady Gaga and John Legend, 
And uh, there are some things that he and the Adam Factory did that um, made them or helped build their careers, right, from the early days. So things around uh, communication strategy, marketing strategy, um, business development, right? Um, those are all the things that, that the Adam Factory did to propel those, those, uh, those careers. Um, additionally, Troy found that when he started investing in uh, Zimride, now Lyft, and Uber, and some of the other ones, those same services were essential for the growth and success of those companies as well. So today, when, well, I guess when we decided to come together, we said, you know, hey, uh, cross culture, we can do the investing, um, but let's let's uh, rely on the Atom Factory to do the work that it's been doing for amazing artists and amazing companies um, for all these years. And it's a it's a super differentiator and uh, value value add for our portfolio companies. And then uh, final question before I turn it over for additional questions. Um, I know that. Both of you also have um, kind of like more of an incubator accelerator program, which you've helped develop some startups. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's called Smash Labs. Um, it's based in LA. They take in six companies every year, um, mostly in media and entertainment, with some exceptions. And they basically get access to Adam Factory for um, six weeks. Uh, the, the, the first class was last year. Um, the companies are doing very, very well. We actually invested in one of them that graduated last year called Sidestep. That's, that's doing it, 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 it extremely well. So it's, um, you know, kind of a incubator in LA that's fitting a, a very specific niche, but we expect to become a much larger one. Um, so, questions? Uh, you, you just mentioned that, like, can you, can you just discuss a little bit how the, the different scene of investing, we talk, I mean, we have an idea of maybe the startup scene, but the investing scene between LA and, and the Yeah, Chicago. yeah, so, so I'm, I'm actually from here. This is, this is my hometown. But I learned venture in LA, working for a big family office in Santa Monica. Um, it's really different. Um, in many ways, LA is a lot how uh, I would say Silicon Valley was in the, the 90s, which is contra a, a controversial thing to say. But I think you find um, a couple things. So, so one, um, founders tend to come from creative backgrounds. There's a lot of cross-pollination be between media, entertainment, and technology. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a hotbed for talent with those cross skill sets. So that's why you have companies like Snapchat um, or even Honest is, is, is another example of, of that cross-pollination. And e-gaming is also huge in LA. Um, another big difference is I think that the community is a lot smaller. There's like three or four big funds, a bunch of angels. Everyone knows everyone. There are no secrets. It's a much more intimate venture environment. That being said, um, San Francisco is still the, the, the Rome of venture capital and startups. This is still the center. Um, so it's important that we have access to, to both places. And we don't, I don't think we necessarily have a, that we're necessarily partial to, to either. Um, but they're both definitely different and cool. Yeah, I mean, we take a global approach to investing. Um, I'm trying to think of the numbers, I think. Three, three companies are in the LA area, um, one's in New York, uh, I think a couple of them are here, uh, one's in Nairobi, Kenya, another one's in Paris, France. Um, we're about to pull the trigger on one that's um, currently based in Korea, um, moving, to, moving to LA, so. How do you guys manage the cultural idiosyncrasies um, with your approach to investing. You said you're doing it on a global scale, so knowing the culture in Silicon Valley is one thing versus the culture in LA is another thing. But I mean, now you guys are just doing this all over the world. How do you like maintain that investment thesis when you're making investments in Africa and in, yeah. in uh, Korea and the United States and all these different places that have distinctly different cultures? How is that central to your thesis if that's? Yeah, you know, so, so we have, um we have another partnership with one of the four largest advertising firms in the world. Um, and they operate in over 180 countries. 
So, uh, and, and they're monitoring consumer behavior. So they're feeding us the data. Um, we take the data, we turn it. And what we're looking for are trends across geographies, right? So to give you an example, one of our companies, um, M-Survey, they're a mobile survey or mobile um, communication platform using chat and, and SMS. Um, and they're the ones that's based in, in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, just show of hands, like, how many of you prefer to text or chat than you do to talk on the phone? That's it? Okay, that's better. Yeah, that, that's, that's <laughs> more in line with the, the data that we're, we're finding, right? Um, chat and text is becoming kind of the de facto uh, means of communication. So knowing that, um, we, we take it as a, as, a, as a theme, right? Moving from voice to, to, to chat. Um, and start to look for interesting opportunities around that. Does that answer it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question about celebrity investing. Uh, it seems like a lot of the uh, sort of past history with celebrity investing has really focused on synergies, especially with the consumer side and sort of consumer brands. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm interested in sort of hearing your thoughts about celebrity investing when it comes to more sort of passion-based projects. And the specific example that I'm thinking of is uh, healthcare, where someone might have a sort of personal connection that might uh, motivate them to make an investment. Is this something that uh, you have seen or had experience with? And if so, um, can you just sort of outline how these deals come together and what they look like? Yeah, so so question back to, to you. Um, are you. Are you talking more about celebrities starting companies or so, so, so celebrities investing more in companies? Okay. Yeah, so, so you know, it's it's funny, like like I think a few deals really introduced celebrities to venture. Um, one of those deals is 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 Uber. <laughs> another one of those deals is Lyft. Mm -hmm. uh, another deal is Stance Stance Socks, which had a ton of celebrity and vet investors in it. Um, I think Dropbox too. Mm -hmm. I think b between those those I think four um, was like really the, the first time that venture folks were, were like, hey, we want to introduce you to this thing. Um, trust me, it's good f for, for you and you can use it to build your brand. Like, I think that c celebrities, like, to, to kind of con conflict with your thesis that they're doing this out of passion pro projects, mm. I think investors are, or, or c celebrities are doing it to make, to, to make money. Um, they see that a lot of people are making a lot of cash here. Um, in many ways, CEOs of startups are becoming c celebrities on the same level as artists. They see that. They see the opportunity for consumer access. Um, so I think it's more strategic than passionate um, in most cases. Now, I, I, I think Jessica Alba is in, is a, is is in the minority where that I think honest was kind of a personal passion pr pr project that 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 was authentic but it's also company versus a multi-billion dollar company at this 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 at this point and I think you know you know I I think that's the real hook I'll I'll say this you know c celebrities are are smarter than you think <laughs> some of them <laughs> Disneyland, Anaheim is in the LA area, Disney's down there. Are there people from the Disney families that are planning in your startup ecosystem? So, so Disney has an accelerator? Um, are you guys, are they doing it? Mm -hmm. are, are, you, are they reaching out to you guys? We look at a few deals um, that come out of there. Um, along with all the other incubators. Um, we, we haven't had specific partnerships with them or, or, or done any specific deals with them yet. Um, but I agree with you that Disney's an incredible company and, and there are a couple, a, a, a couple deals that we've done that are based on Disney, essentially. Um, based, on, based on the idea of amazing storytelling <laughs> and being in, 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 in how that is core to what entertainment actually is. I think Disney started that model 
and many many companies are are vying for that proposition right now. So I'm thinking if you can get Disney to let um, animated characters invest in your fund, I'd be totally down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, companies that uh, begin with Smash Labs, like what is that process, that six weeks process? What are you guys like teaching them? Like what are they, what's the focus during those six weeks? And then like how do you measure like which startup that you're going to invest in at the end? Yeah. The companies that, that go through Smash are a little bit, it's a little bit different than most accelerators. Um, they're, they're usually uh, farther along in their, um, in their life cycle. And so what we try to do is mostly around um, business development and, uh, and mentoring from, from folks that, are, that have lived um, in the spaces that, that, that they're working in. So as an example, um, in, during the six weeks, you know, they, may, they may meet something like uh, or hear from five, four or five different mentors on a daily basis. Um, in the spaces of technology, um, uh, entertainment, and culture, essentially. So we're talking folks like you know Russell Simmons, uh, Travis from um, Uber, um, Troy does some, we do some. Who else? Um, Pretty much like everyone in LA. Yeah. And and many folks from from up here. It's it's kind of like Jason Calcan Cal Yeah. Um, from up here, um, a bunch of folks. So it's, it's hmm? yeah, Mark Schuster. It's it's really about um, how do you how do you grow this this uh, company more than it is, um, and how do we how do we leverage our, our vast network of uh, corporations and individuals to make that happen. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, since you have presence um, around the globe, what are some of the differences that you observe in terms of like? investments in the um, um, media and the technology of um, comparing the East with the West? So that's, I think that's a great <laughs> question. We, we've actually been thinking about this a ton because um, we just did a deal that's like, we, we think it's a fusion between the East and the, the West. Like, the, the truth is, is that the cultures aren't all that different. You know, uh, the, some, you, you've probably heard of this idea of convergence, where there's kind of a, a meta culture or a couple of meta themes that drive all mainstream cultures. I, I, I think that's, that's maybe not completely true yet, but it's becoming true, true fast, in that we, we see that there are definitely trends, technology trends, that cross borders. <coughs> And, there's, and there are definitely brands or behaviors that are just as cool in Mississippi as they are in Ningbo, you know? And, and, and um, the more that we can understand those and, and find those early, I think the, the, the better off that will, 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 will be. But specifically, um, one thing that, that, that we think is gonna be interesting in the U.S. soon, um, coming from the East um, is, is fiction. So serialized fiction. Um, you know, we've seen eSports, we've seen chat, we've seen anime, we've seen um, micro payments. We've, we, we've, we've, we've seen all these things blow up in places like China and India and trickle over here. Um, I think that another huge one is gonna be the way that people consume literary content. Mm -hmm. So we have about five minutes left and I wanna ask a couple questions since I think we're really lucky to have two founding partners, two founding GPs of a VC fund here today. Um, so first question related to kind of GP LP dynamics is, um, how do you make um, investment decisions at the firm? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so that's a big question, but, but um, yeah. In general, we're a consensus shop. Mm -hmm. so, so we have three partners and we all come to agreement um, through the, the discussion on pretty much everything, um, which, which we think is a really, really powerful, a powerful way to 
um, make sure that everyone's voice is heard on every deal. Um, so we're very, very high touch with each other um, and with founders. Like with, with some firms, you'll find that you can meet one partner and the deal is just done and you might not ever meet anyone else at the firm. But with us, we're very much like a f family. Yeah, we all have different, um, different backgrounds um, and, and interests and experiences. And uh, the, the, the amazing thing is it all comes together. Uh, and we want to make sure that we, that we kind of bottle that. Um, and, and it helps us to make the best decisions, right? So, you know, uh, Trevor, for instance, um, background in uh, logistics, right? Um, you know, Troy's entertainment. I've got uh, software, right? We all look at deals from different lens. And um, when we're really rocking, when we're really in flow, is when we're each pulling something from our backgrounds and analyzing, analyzing the deal and trying to make the right decision. Because there are times when I br I'll bring something in and I love it. And then, you know, five minutes into the conversation, I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and, and vice versa. So it's a, you know, it's a way to avoid, avoid groupthink um, and to uh, kind of do away with the, the herd mentality that you see a lot of times in, um, in venture capital. And I know there is at least one or two people in the class who are currently raising venture funds. Mm -hmm. um, given that you just raised a fund in mm -hmm. this environment today, mm -hmm. what do you think are um, the top one or two things that um, founding VCs should consider? You know, um, I, uh huh? Be patient. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's, it's definitely um, an interesting process that's very different than raising for a startup. Um, so think about that. It's much more civil, but a little bit more, more stodgy. Um, I, th I think that it's probably the best time in history to raise your first fund and that many of the big uh, institutional investors and fund of funds have seen recently the success of new first time funds and they're eager to make sure that they invest early so that in the next fund they'll still have a spot. So, so I, I, even within the, the time that we've started, we, we've seen a huge shift from folks who are like, we would never do a for, for first time fund to um, we have this much capital allocated just for first time managers. So I, I, I definitely think it's a, it's a good, good time. At the, the same time, because it's such a good, good, good time, you have a whole bunch of people trying to raise. Uh, so differentiation is very, very important. So you have to think about, you know, really, really honestly, how, how are you uniquely going to provide um, alpha to these people's portfolios? And that's actually kind of a really hard question um, that you're going to have to wrestle with to make sure that it's strong enough to raise. Yeah, I think there are two, two things that LPs are, are, are truly looking for. Um, one, do you have access to unique um, deal flow, right? Can you bring those in and can you close them? And two, uh, is the partner risk. Um, how compatible are you guys and will your funds stay together? And uh, you gotta find creative ways, especially if you haven't worked together as, as um, investors before, to, you know, um, to prove that you are the right team, the right pair or the right trio, um, and that you are able to find these deals. So one thing you, you think about is how to get to work sooner than later, how to get some deals done together um, so that you can start to see, the, um, uh, see those, those companies perform as you're going through that fundraising process. Because um, showing is a lot, a lot better than, than just telling someone you can, or a group that you can do it. And I think both Trevor Marlin and Troy have done a really good job fundraising. There's actually a very well-known, large, local Silicon Valley corporate VC who, I won't share the name since I don't know if this is public, but um, they've actually invested in the fund and that's the only VC fund that they've invested in. So maybe you can get the name out of them after class. Um, so thank you again. Thanks. 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 Thank you.